Pokemon is one of the largest and longest running monster franchises in gaming. And in that time, it's developed and changed its style a lot. But what makes a good creature design? How does an art style change over the years? And why is that? As a creature concept artist myself, I've been fascinated with Pokemon's design ever since I got my first copy of Pokemon Red. And I'd like to propose that whilst Pokemon currently has eight generations of mainline games, there's really only three errors of Pokemon design. I'm going to call these the classic error, the abstract error, and the plushy error. And in this video, I'd like to explain what makes each of these errors unique, what it has to say about Pokemon design, and where Pokemon might head to next. I'm Sam Santala, a professional concept artist in the games industry, and this is Concept Field Guide, a series all about the art and design in video games and entertainment. So please, sit down, grab yourself an ethically sourced slowpoke tail, and watch as I explain the three errors of Pokemon design. The classic era started all the way back in 1990 and was originally the brainchild of just one man, Satoshi Tajiri. But you can see at this early stage that many Pokemon are a bit unrefined and kind of look like simple generic RPG fantasy monsters. Whilst some do show hints as to the kind of Pokemon they would eventually become, they have not yet mastered the techniques that make Pokemon so unique and identifiable. An artist rule that can be helpful to illustrate this is Silhouette. Silhouette is simply the outline of a design, and when utilised effectively, it can help make designs appear unique and telegraph important mood or posture. But for an example of bad Silhouette, we need to look no further than these three beta sprites. Now these three Pokemon all look fairly similar. They all have the same kind of weighting, they all have these slight reptilian features, and if we put them in silhouette, it becomes even harder to tell them apart. They're just lumpy messes with slight bumps and nubs on them. And in important moments like evolving Pokemon, having good, clear, readable silhouette is paramount. But you can tell by the end of this era, they would have really figured out how to make these Pokemon more visually appealing. Like Gengar here has gone through an amazing transformation from his lumpy beta sprite into one of Pokemon's most iconic designs. And all it took was a few adjustments to its silhouette. We can now see that its limbs are clearly defined. Those nubs are now gone, replaced instead with clear tufts of spiky fur. And most obviously, and I think most importantly, it's now got a very prominent set of spiky ears breaking away from its silhouette. Which I think contributes to him still being such a popular Pokemon even this many years on. But one thing I really love about this era of Pokemon design is just how much these designs are clearly referencing real world animals and plants. Sure, there's a few nuts and bolts, there's a mime, and a... a thing. But for the most part, and especially in Generation 2, there's a lot of designs that are just simply animals and plants. Which, as a creature designer, you always want, because it just makes designs immediately relatable. But interestingly, because this is still so new and experimental in figuring out what a Pokemon actually is, there's this level of anatomy to the designs that I don't think we ever really get to see again, or at least not like this anyway. Like. Take Ponyta for instance, it's got these knobbly ankles and knees, and these really naturalistic shapes to its form, but if we compare that to say, Blitzel, another equine Pokemon from much later in Generation 5, Blitzel instead has these much smoother and much rounder features, with very little definition and a whole lot of simplification. Lastly, let's talk about colour, or more so, a lack of it. All the way back in the 1990s, the original Game Boy was the device of choice for this kind of game, but technologically the Game Boy was incredibly limited. The sprites were fairly small, and you really only had four shades of grey to try and express your design. So instead of focusing on complex patterns or texture, Game Freak made the smart move and decided to focus less on colour and instead on contrasting light and dark tones, or values. 
but what can you really do with a limited set of values? Well, as in all things in art, it's all about contrast. The human eye is always drawn to naturally contrasting areas, so as a general rule, it's always better to put your mid-tones in areas that aren't that important, but then use your darkest and your lightest values against one another so that it immediately draws the viewer's eye. I think it's very telling that Game Freak chooses to focus on these cute aspects of Pikachu rather than its spiky tail, because these really focus on how cute and lovable he is rather than his combat potential. However, because Game Freak has chosen to focus on value rather than colour or texture, it means that many of the Pokemon in this era, and especially in Generation 1, can have pretty similar or analogous colour schemes. But this isn't in itself a bad thing. It just means that right now they're not using every tool that's at an artist's disposal in order to try and make these designs have an increased level of narrative or focus on key areas. By the time that Gold and Silver come out, we can see that they are beginning to experiment with some colour and pattern, like Azumarill's circles representing bubbles for its water typing, or Giraffarig's spots resembling the yin and yang symbol for its theme of balance. This is because by the time Gold and Silver would go into production, Game Freak were well aware of the Game Boy Color's new capabilities, and they took full advantage of that to create more visually interesting Pokemon designs. But it's really in the next era that they begin turning all of these features way up to 11. From Generation 3 until around Generation 5, the abstract era finds itself with very little in terms of limitations on presenting designs and goes all out in experimenting with new ways to make expressive and interesting Pokemon. Pokemon at this point have started using less analogous colours and started instead complementing and contrasting them with wildly different hues and values. This can be so good when used on creature designs because it really helps more tightly focus what you want the narrative of this creature to be, or maybe what focal points it has, or even perhaps what kind of attacks it might have. Haxorus, for instance, is mostly dullish shades of grey and green, but it has this really nice splash of vibrant red on its mouth blades. This makes them stand out really nicely and telegraphs to you that this is very likely a physically offensive Pokemon. But I feel at this point that the development of the Pokemon is somewhat immature. By that, what I mean is that before, when they weren't utilising colours and now having the freedom to do so, they have veered from one extreme to the other, with designs sometimes feeling a little bit garish and excessive. As in some Pokemon, what they choose to focus on can even be distracting from what I think is the main point of the design. Like, let's take a look at Licky Licky. We would assume that the focal point of this kind of creature would be maybe its tongue. I mean, it's literally in the name. So you would expect contrasting colours or values to be there, but instead we find them on the belly, which feels distracting. And these contrasting yellow shapes form arrows, which actually point away from the tongue and ruins the narrative. I mean, none of it makes sense. Honestly, to me, it feels like this happens so often during this era. Everything just feels badly utilised, everything's a bit of a mess visually. But interestingly enough, where colours have now become more complicated and busy, the exact opposite has happened with shapes and geometry in this era's Pokemon. Now, the classic era certainly utilised shape language, but it was never quite so explicit as in this era. Naturalistic form has now been replaced with more representative or abstract shapes. This makes them easier to understand and replicate for Pokemon's intended audience. That is, of course, children. Like with Cresselia, who is themed around dreams and night, and is very clearly utilising the crescent moon shape throughout its design, but I can't really tell what it's supposed to be exactly. Is it some kind of space duck? It, it's honestly hard to tell. For a more direct comparison, we could compare something like Persian from Pokemon Red and Blue, and Delcati from Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. Both are clearly stylized cats of some kind, but whereas Persian has these almost naturalistic shapes with some level of anatomy in the legs, a plumping out of its maw, and some nice delicate whiskers, Delcati instead is made of these rounded tubes. Its face is oddly flat, and its whiskers are more like spikes. The easiest way to put it is Persian is representative of a cat, but Delcati is an abstraction of one. Whilst this era clearly isn't my favourite in terms of design, 
it's obvious at this point that Game Freak are still trying to learn what they can push in terms of what is a good and a bad Pokemon. And there are some real gems in here too, where all of these art principles are just utilized so effectively and manage to make really appealing or aesthetic Pokemon designs. Now let's take Empoleon, for example. Like most water Pokemon, it's got those cool blues representing its typing, but they're kind of used as accents on these spikes in order to kind of make it look more offensive. But it's also got this nice contrasting ruffled collar pattern that's reminiscent of the French aristocracy, much like his namesake. But lastly, and most obviously, is I think this really prominent trident design that not only breaks away from its form and gives him this really unique silhouette, but the contrasting yellow also creates this really prominent focal point on his face and, and adds to the aquatic motif with his weapon literally used by the god of the ocean. It's, it's great theming, like it's a really fantastic design that shows exactly what these kind of changes can do when they're effectively utilized in a Pokemon design. But finally, it's time to talk about the modern games and what I think will likely be the largest final change we'll see to the Pokemon art style for a very long time. The plushie era really kicked off in Generation 6, and Pokemon X and Y were an absolute game changer in so many ways for Pokemon. Not only do we see a return to the more explicit, naturalistic themes in their Pokemon designs, but also Game Freak seems to have learnt some level of finesse and restraint in terms of the art principles it was experimenting with in the previous era. I'd really like to point out just how advanced some of these designs are. Two of my favourites from this era are Lycanroc and Dragapult. As is usual in most designs, the main focal point is going to be the head, but where Dragapult uses this smooth curving form and even some level of arrow motifs in the design to lead your eye there, Lycanroc instead uses a technique called spoke wheeling, where these hard lines form that all point to one focal area, like the spokes on a wheel. You'll also notice each of these designs utilizes that focus on the head to use triangular shape language giving these designs some aggressiveness and combative theming too. These are contrasted nicely with these softer shapes in the less important tertiary areas to give the creatures both a threatening vibe, but also a charming appearance that Pokemon always seems to strive for. I love them so much. Another key aspect of this era is something I'm going to call waiting. I've touched on wait before, but now let me give you some examples. If we use a weight like 70-30, you can see that 70% of the design, or weight, will be in one area, and then 30% will contrast it in another area, just like we've seen with colours, with larger tones being complemented by much smaller contrasting tones. For a few examples of this during this era, we could look at Pokemon like Toxapex, Dupiter, and Turtonator, who each have this larger area, making up a big section of its design, but will then have this much smaller area that contrasts it. Waiting, for me personally, is one of my favorite tools when it comes to concept art, because a design in which everything is balanced can feel a bit undynamic or boring or stale. Clustering also really starts to take effect in this era as well. Let's take a look at one of the earliest Pokemon, Venonat from Pokemon Red and Blue. Now, you can see that its body is covered in fur, but how that fur is expressed is through thin, jaggedy points that kind of explode from every direction around its body. Let's compare this with a Pokemon from this current era, like Aromatisse, who instead uses these thicker or plumper and smoother clumps of fur that are then clustered into these little areas around its body. You're probably sick of me saying this, but clustering again is all about contrast. The contrast here is by allowing busy areas to sit next to smooth areas. For instance, smooth areas are there to allow the eyes to travel across a design and not distract the person, whilst the busy, more clustered areas draw the eye and then become more prominent. You can really notice during this era that they've taken every art principle that I've mentioned and then just honed it into the most perfect use possible. It's pretty impressive. But lastly, let's talk about the reason why I call this the plushy era. Many of these designs have become extremely simplified, 
there's a real reduction in terms of visual noise, everything is designed to be easily readable for children, and there's a real increase in the use of softer or more plumped out areas. Let's take Chespin as a perfect example of this. Chespin, ostensibly, is supposed to be covered in these defensive spikes that should be immediately read as dangerous and ward off attackers and predators. But by looking at earlier Pokemon like Silcoon, who also has spikes, you can see that these actually look defensive and threatening, like they'd impale you if you actually tried to grab one. Chespin instead has these softer, rounded spikes that seem somewhat inflated, like, I don't know, maybe like the kind of spikes that a plushie would have? But this is not a bug, this is a feature. Pokemon at this point is by most estimates the most profitable franchise on Earth. But if we look at the company's profits and see how much of that is actually made up of video game sales, it's barely one fifth. What I mean to say here is that the plushie error is what happens when your art style becomes corporate. It's extremely refined and each Pokemon is clearly considered by an entire team of people in order to create maximum charm. It's honestly kind of impressive just how lovable the team at Game Freak managed to make even Pokemon like... Uh, some kind of sea cucumber? Pokemon at this point aren't just creatures for you to collect and to battle, they are also merchandise, they are toys, they are products. Many of us older fans now have to remember that we are not Pokemon's target audience anymore. We are just fans who grew up with it, and whilst we do love them, we should not complain when they don't specifically go out of their way to appeal to just us anymore. In conclusion, I certainly learned that Pokemon is a very, very dense topic to cover. But I hope that what we can take away from this video is that each era has worked really hard within the limitations of their technology to create interesting, eye-catching designs and has really reflected the environment in which they were made. From the rough, individualistic charm of the classic era, where a small team meant that whilst many of the designs aren't perfect, there is a kind of quaint charm to many of them as well. Or in the abstract era, which would improve technologically, giving Game Freak the freedom to really explore and push many artistic principles and designs in their Pokemon, too far I would argue in some places. All the way to the modern day in the plushie era, where Pokemon is a global phenomenon and is now headed by a very large, very talented team that create Pokemon designs with an almost industrial level of charm that are both easy to love and easy for young people to draw themselves. Now, you might have noticed that I didn't touch upon Mega Evolutions, Ultra Beasts and Gigantamax Pokemon. Well, that's because, frankly, that could be an entire other video topic on its own, which I would love to get around to at some point. But for now, I want to mention that I think that the reason that many of these gimmicks began to appear around the time of the plushy era is partly because this refinement of the art principles has created something of a bounding box as to how far you can actually push a Pokemon design. And whilst that box is fairly wide, there's always going to be a level of restriction that can cause things to feel a bit repetitive or derivative if you end up just repeating the same kind of designs over and over and over again. So how do you keep things new? Well, you introduce things like a new stage of evolution, or a kaiju form, or a different dimension, or let's say a new time period. Now, I suspect that focusing on these variations will continue into future generations as well, with Pokemon trying out more experimental things outside of their typical three-stage evolution tree to try and keep their designs fresh, but while still utilizing their refined Pokemon design principles. Game Freak at this point has really perfected their craft and I don't see them changing that anytime soon. Now, you may prefer the older generations and their rough charm, or you might prefer the more modern style, or God forbid, you might even like Generation 4, for some reason. But I think the thing that connects us all, regardless of what era or what gen or what type of Pokemon you like, is that we all just love Pokemon and we're excited when a new game comes out with some new interesting takes on lovable creatures that you can tame and make friends with. And I, 
Can't wait to see what kind of Pokemon Game Freak continues to make as we go into the future. Thanks so much for watching to the end everyone. This took a lot, a lot longer than I had originally planned, but I'm glad I finally got this out for you all to see. So if you learned anything, please let me know and I'd love to hear your opinions on it. And if you did enjoy it, I would really appreciate it if you could give me a like and subscribe as it really helps out the channel and lets me know what kind of content you would like to see me talk about. I want to say an extra special thanks to my friend Mido who spent a very long time collecting gameplay footage for me and edited the first version of this video that went into far more nitty gritty detail between the generations. If you'd like to see that version of the video, I'm thinking I might make it available to my lovely patrons over at Patreon who should be listed in the credits at the side now. But yeah, thanks folks. Hopefully you learned a lot. Hopefully there's a lot of art appreciation in the comments and until next time, I'll see you later. Bye.